So I want to say a few words about the cyclohexene uh, three-dimensional conformation. Um, and uh, because a cyclohexene has two sp2 carbons in it, it, it can't adopt a perfect chair conformation that the cyclohexane can. Uh, and the three-dimensional structure is a little bit more flatter than the uh, than with the, the cyclohexane. Uh, but there is still a bit of a conformation which we need to learn how to just uh, represent and draw. And it's going to help just to make sense of some of the reactions that uh, we, 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 we do on this structures that look like cyclohexenes. So I've got a, a three-dimensional structure over here. The blue bonds over here are the double bonds for the, uh, for the pi uh, or the, the sigma and the pi bond that we have there. It's not, not a perfect representation. Um, and if we look at this, it's not a perfect chair, but we're going to look at it kind of end on. Now, we don't get a very good uh, sort of picture of this, but I just want to see if we can uh, see what we can. I'm gonna, these blue bonds are obscuring the atoms at the back. Um, but we imagine, let's just imagine that there's a straight line across here. Um, you see how the carbon at the back, this one, this one, and the carbon at the back over there all seem to be in one straight line. Um, and then the two carbons over there, right at the back, go alternatively up over there and down over here. And, and this is the one part of where the cyclohexene can undergo a conformational switch. So because those back carbons are sp3, I'm going to put on just a substituent anyway. I'm going to put it on that position over there. And let's just look at it again from this, this angle. <clears throat> All right. Trying to get it straight. And we see that the group at the back there seems to be pointing straight up. And that's effectively an axial position. And so that's not ideal. It would prefer to be equatorial. And so we can switch these two back ones around by doing a conformational switch. So what happens is the whole thing flips like that. And now when we look at it, all right, it is obscured, but that uh, group at the back is now pointing kind of up, although it's hidden. That's, that's an equatorial type of position. So we can represent this. Um, uh, using line diagrams um, and in order to kind of best describe this three-dimensional aspect to it and the way we do it is we as I've been showing it to you now we're looking down this bond over here in other words we're looking um, our eye is over here and we're looking across at this bond and what we do is as I showed you in that structure <clears throat> we see the double bond there are two atoms there and then we straight across we actually see two atoms over there as well and then at the back, there's one at the top, and then this goes down, and there's another one over there, and it comes up. So this diagram, this which is called the half chair for cyclohexenes, it's a half chair diagram. It's a bit more of an exaggeration of this that we're seeing over here. All right, just trying to get that straight to you. So it's a bit. Well, let's do it this way around. No, it's the other one. Yeah. There we go. That should do it, hopefully. Okay, it's an exaggeration of what I'm showing you over here. All right, so the carbon over there is much higher than, than this one is as we've drawn it, and this carbon over here is much lower than the one that's over here. But what it does is it, it enables us to kind of put all the substituents on in that axial equatorial type of thing. So this position over here, straight down, must be the axial position. And that means equatorial must be up, but it must be it's equatorial up. So we don't have these, an, these uh, um, uh, parallel lines that we can work with. So we just have to sketch it in ourselves. So go, it'll be going up like that. So it's equatorial up. Can't be equatorial down because it's axial down. Right, so it has to be up. And over here, axial will be straight up and it would be equatorial uh, down over there. So, um, <clears throat> for example, we have a cyclohexene. We put a substituent on. Let's uh, put on a isopropyl group. And we're going we're gonna to put the isopropyl group. Uh, it's going up. We can assign a chirality to that. 
uh, Cairo Center to that, ROS, you should be able to do that. Uh, and we're now going to draw it as a half chair. So how do we do it? Well, we sketch our half chair, boom, like that. We draw it. All right, that's uh, a bit messy because that line should, that's a single bond that's going behind there. So I should have had that a bit straight. And then we're looking at this side over here. There's carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six. So that's carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six over there. Oh, that's very light. Um, but carbon five has an isopropyl group on isopropyl group is facing up. So it must be, as I've drawn it here, actually the axial position. All right. Notice I've just drawn a line. This is the same with the cyclohexane rings, but we just draw a line. I don't draw a wedge because the wedges are only for when we're drawing uh, flat structures. I drew this. The isopropyl group is pointing in an axial position. This cannot be the preferred conformation. It must be in equilibrium with the preferred conformation, uh, which is where the isopropyl group is equatorial. And for it to be equatorial, it has to ring flip, which means this must come to the bottom. This one must go to the top, so I can redraw it. It's fairly easy to do. This is much easier than the cyclohexanes, uh, and it looks like that. And so now the isopropyl is in an equatorial position uh, like that. We can put that in. All right, so um, just uh, review this again. This is in your textbook. Uh, you should be able to get an, uh, be able to do these uh, cyclohexene rings, um, and my uh, my next video is going to be looking at uh, an explanation, although you don't need to give it per se, of the uh, ring opening of epoxides, which needs this uh, uh, cyclohexene uh, structure.